Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Flinchball here and we're doing our, our interviews on strategy, strategic thinker, strategic planning. Uh, have with us today a good friend of mine, Jeff Grimshaw, who's uh, one of the co-founders of MG Strategy. Uh, worked together before, hung out, talk shop, and so today we're going to talk shop uh, on strategy. So Jeff, why don't you, hello, and why don't you tell us a little more about yourself? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Jamie, I'm happy to talk to you about any topic, anytime, but I was excited when you asked me to talk about strategy. Uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, you know, I talk about anything, that regardless of whether I have an informed point of view, but I'd like to think this <laughs> is one of those uh, handful of topics that I might actually have an informed point, uh, point of view on. Uh, so yeah, thank you for uh, the uh, introduction uh, uh, of MG Strategy, uh, where I'm one of the principals and um, also the author of two books. Uh, first one is Leadership Without Excuses, How to Create Accountability and High Performance, instead of just talking about it. I'd like to make sure there's, you know, at least, uh, you know, 40 syllables in each of these uh, uh, book titles. <laughs> and, and the one that came out just this last year is Five Frequencies, Leadership Signals to Turn Culture into Competitive Advantage. Fantastic. And great books. I've, I've been fans of both. And, and, and yeah, with strategy, I mean, we haven't done this much, but I did at least once get to uh, engage with you on a, on a client on some strategy building. And so I know that you do a range of different things, but helping helping leaders with, with their strategy is, is a part of it. So when that conversation starts, I mean, what, how do you define strategy? It's an easy word to throw around. What does, what does strategy look like to you? The way I think about strategy is that it is uh, managing activities and trade-offs in an effort to maximize ROI with a time horizon that is longer than 15 minutes from now. So in other words, you know, we've got activities and life's full of trade-offs. So it's about making those decisions in a way where we want to get maximum value from that. And we're thinking whether it's, again, further than 15 minutes out, it could be 15 uh, days from now, it could be 15 months from now, it could be 15, uh, years from now, uh, but that longer time horizon, I think, is a key element. It's not just goal-directed. It's goal-directed with a longer time horizon than what's immediately in front of us, I think, is key. That's, that's really an uh, important perspective, right? So the time horizon is, is a big factor in whether, whether it's strategy or just, uh, just tactics. Um, in, in, as you said, time horizon might be longer than 15 minutes, but it might be weeks, it might be years. Is the difference between weeks and years based on how fast an organization's market is moving or how far they're moving or where they are in the organization? What, what, what determines what that time horizon should look like? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, we are increasingly in an environment where we are, uh, uh, where when we say years, we might be fooling ourselves a lot of time. We, if we're thinking about an organizational scale, uh, weeks are sometimes too short, but I think the, um, uh, but I think, uh, I, I also just think in my experience it, with working with leaders is that um, things have to, 18 months feels, even even 18 months or more feels theoretical to people. And that, um, and I think it's it's easier for people to make choices, to make tough trade-off decisions when the consequences feel closer. So I guess that's a long way of saying, I'm, I'm seeing increasingly that while it's important to push the time horizon out longer than 15 minutes, I'm also seeing on the other side, the time, the, the time horizon coming closer in terms of, you know, it's not five years as it's, you know, it's getting 18 months and then getting pulled closer back. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's fair. I, I've seen that, that same sort of shift happening where the order of magnitude of changes might not be bigger than it was 40 years ago, but it is faster and that, right. that affects it. I, 
Now, I do think that having a perspective that's multi-year, uh, having a point of view, having a, uh, a, a, a vision might, might have a time horizon, but as you said, making trade-off decisions, that's, that's tougher to do unless they're very material in terms of making trade-offs. Yeah. You know, the, uh, and I think one of the things that's also uh, really important to me and I think important uh, to leaders is that when you're talking about strategy, that it's, uh, and you're thinking about trade-offs, that uh, it's, it's not just about business planning. It's about just about everything. One of the things I was thinking about, because I, I saw the, the, somebody was mentioning this client, and I was thinking about him the other day. There's a guy, and this was about 15 years ago, actually, uh, where he was working, he was a, a direct report to Joe Naccio, uh, who uh, was the CEO at Quest, who uh, you know, later went to uh, prison. Uh, but back when this was happening, this was a guy who was a, a member of Joe Naccio's team, and Joe had said to him, hey, you do these few things, and I'm going to back your play. And so this guy that I was working for uh, did these few things, and instead of Joe backing his play, he just uh, humiliated him in front of the rest of the executive team. And so I was out in Denver, and he said, Jeff, I need your help on what I'm going to do here. I, which, of these, which of these ways should I go in and tell Joe uh, that that was completely unacceptable and tell him basically to F off? I mean, you know, it was just variations on a theme. Right. And I said, I want to help you be strategic here. There's a, there's a, there's a frame of reference uh, in communication that says uh, all – uh, it, there are three goals in all human communication. There's task, identity, and relationships. And I said to this guy, I said to this leader, okay, what are your identity goals here? And he said, you know, how do you want to be seen? And he said, I want to be seen as somebody who you can't do that to, you know, where you can't, you can't mess with them the way that I was messed with here. And I said, great. What are your relationship goals? And he said, yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, I, I don't want to be, you know, I'm not going to be stepped on that way. He needs to know that that's not acceptable. And I said, great, what are your task goals? And uh, he said, well, and I said, no, really think about this. Like, what do you want to be true? What do you want to be true? Not 15 minutes from now, but like 15 days, 15 months, 15 years from now. And he said, honestly, what I'd really like to do, what I'd really like to do is uh, take a package and get out of here. I've been here for 18 months. I'm ready to be done. So I said, okay, well, listen, then let's be strategic because that's about managing your choices and your trade-offs with a longer time horizon than what is going to have you feeling satisfied 15 minutes from now. So do you want to go in and, and like express yourself and try to get an apology or do you want to just artfully frame this in a way where you get a, uh, where he pays you, you know, millions of dollars to walk off into the sunset? So the strategic choice, you know, I should have worked on commission that day because I, you know, taking a few percentage points of that would have would have paid off. But that's that's why I think it's important to say that that the reason I like that definition of of strategy is because it applies to uh, not just business planning but all the choices that we make as human beings who happen to you know spend time uh, in organizations and in business. And, you know, so he, he made the strategic choice that I'm sure he is still very happy about 15 years later. He went in and he got the package and used that as an exit opportunity. He never got an apology from Joe Naccio, which would have been uh, meaningless anyway. Right. Uh, but that was about being, uh, but, but he thought about his ROI and his trade-offs. Now, that's a good example because it really does demonstrate that even when the situation was unplanned, or has nothing to do about the organization, but it's about the individual strategy still has a fundamental role. And, um, and so it's how you approach something rather than what it is. So let me just building on that and maybe pulling that apart a little further, it kind of leads to this is again, the definition of a strategy, but is it, is it a process? 
is it is it a decision right or is it just a way of thinking and, and that example really demonstrated a little bit of all three yeah but but how do you how do you look at those three different dimensions uh yeah i i'm going to start with a way of thinking i agree that there's elements of all all three of those apply but to me i think it has to be rooted in a way of thinking i'm a big fan of daniel kahneman who was you know the psychologist who won the nobel prize in economics in 2002 uh first person ever won the nobel prize in economics who never took an economics course but you know what is his claim to fame was actually bringing uh, uh, behavioral psychology into play to actually do it, help uh, economists do a better job of explaining how people make trade-off decisions. And he, uh, and he, you know, he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and his, the idea was that humans have operate from, we have two systems, and system one is our intuition, and it's automatic, it's effortless, it's, it's, it's fast, and it produces impressions. And system two is uh, really about reason. So it's slower, it's more deliberate. Um, it can be rules governed, uh, but you know, it, it's about going, actually you know, consuming the, the brain power to produce uh, decisions, uh, judgments and decisions, right? And uh, so just going back to the question about, you know, so where does strategy come from? It's really about uh, being deliberate about when you're gonna be deliberate because, uh, you know, if all you're doing is operating from system one all of the time, then you're probably not being strategic uh, when you need to be strategic. Um, as human beings, though, I mean, we are not capable of operating from system two all the time. We, we, you know, we have to run on autopilot for many, many of the functions that we do. But a lot of self-awareness is required so that you can be, um, uh, so that you at least have triggers where you know you have to stop and choose to be strategic about something. But I, I said that one of the things that Kahneman said about um, our reason uh, or our system two thinking is is that it can be rule governed, and and what that means is you can have good heuristics or rules of thumb uh, that you use to help you make strategic choices so that you can do them as fast as possible. I mean, the reason that we we rely mostly on system one and intuition is because we don't have time. But if you have a good set of heuristics, if you have a good set of, of rules of thumb that you don't use automatically, but at least help you make choices, then uh, uh, that helps you that helps you be more strategic. So, for example, when when that that example I was using earlier, the heuristic is to pause and to say, what am I trying to do in terms of task? What am I trying to do in terms of relationship? What am I trying to do in terms of identity? Or you know, Jamie, that when we are helping helping uh, clients think about culture, we say in the culture that gives you a source of competitive advantage, what do you need people to know and to feel and to do and to get really prioritized about that? So whether it's about heuristics or decision rules or whether it's just about frameworks, there are some things that you can do to fast track. So it's a process. Uh, that you that rooted in rooted in thinking there's some things that you can do to fast track your ability to efficiently actually apply strategic thinking to situations where otherwise you might just be uh, uh, left to run on uh, you know effortless uh, intuition which might turn out great and might turn out uh, terrible uh, because it was not actually based on strategy All right. No, it's a, it's a favorite book of mine. Um, I, I love uh, I love that particular book, and 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 you know what both of us do for a living is often help pull people into system two, and improve yeah. their system one as a as an outcome or delivery. Right, right. So we we both spend a lot of time you know thinking about that as a as a process, and that ultimately becomes a strategic choice. Right. And, and certainly, as, as it's demonstrated, some people are 
uh, more, better built for changing from system one to system two. Uh, some people are just smarter about when they do it. But, but carrying, that, carrying that forward, that implies that there's a core capability there, right? And so you know, almost every organization today has a defined set of core capabilities that they want all their employees to have or all their managers to have. Some of them are often very generic, which is always frustrating to me, but it's not uncommon that strategic thinking ends up on the list, even though it may be ill-defined. Um, but this really begs the question, especially framed around system one, system two, being deliberate uh, part is, is, is this, and I think I might know your answer, but I'd love to hear the reasons why, is this a capability that everyone should have, or is it really just for the critical few making the most important decisions? Yeah, I think it's important uh, uh, for everybody uh, to, um, to uh, I, think, I think we'd all be well served if everybody upgraded their strategic thinking a notch or two. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I, you demonstrated with that example, it's even about the choice of do I, do I work in this company to stay and change my position or do I work to position to get myself out? Well, name, right. name a person who doesn't make a, a choice like that at some point, and that's a strategic decision. So that's a great example that illustrates the idea that it's a, it's a human capability, not just a, a, an executive capability. Yeah, and I, you know, I, in terms of like the stuff I get geeked out on, you know, I, I love, I, I love behavioral economics, and I love economists like Tim Harford who are applying, you know, economics is all about uh, value and trade-offs, and and I love those guys who are applying the science to and, and those uh, those ways of thinking to everyday decision making, because um, I think there's a I think that self-awareness is really key. I mean, I think that actually is so much of what strategic thinking uh, is about. Uh, I think a lot of organizations, when they say they want people to be strategic thinkers, uh, don't really know what they're talking about. They talk about it in very uh, generic ways. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, um, that uh, to me, what's really important in terms of developing those capabilities is understanding uh, human biases, you know, having a user's manual for your brain, understanding what kinds of things that, that your brain is probably wired to do that, uh, that uh, are going to influence uh, your trade-off decisions, your development of strategy, so, you know, planning fallacy, for example, is one of the things where we, you know, uh, we tend to be have rosy scenarios for uh, how things are going to go, and we build that into our thinking uh, and end up with bad strategy as a result. Uh, some cost fallacy where we, you know, disproport or where we irrationally continue to throw uh, energy and invest in uh, in something to avoid the appearance of waste. Uh, you know where you. Uh, uh, those are things that if you're aware of them and aware of your brain's propensity to tell you that something is actually rational and value creating when it isn't, that to me is, is core about being uh, is strategic thinking. And I think there's not a lot of, there, you know, there's a lot of uh, people in the world who uh, have important decision-making authority and have no self-awareness whatsoever it appears about the cognitive biases that are going into their strategic decisions. I, I had a boss for a long time who used to say to people, including to me all the time, well, that wasn't strategic. What you did wasn't strategic. But what I learned that he meant over time was he just meant uh, not being strategic meant I didn't do things the way or whoever he was talking about didn't do things the way that he would have liked or preferred. So I think it does mean that the you know, word strategy has been, you know, it, it's maybe always been um, always been vague, but it, 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 it certainly is, and, and probably bastardized in terms of just being an adjective that you apply to something, you know, being strategic or not. In a lot of cases, I think 
when we say that somebody is strategic, it just really means that they're they're hyper conventional. You know that one of the things that I think people uh, do in organizations, and one of the things I think sometimes organizations are trying to get people to do when they tell them to be strategic is to just really learn the conventions of the organization as quickly as possible. And so if you can become hyper conventional, then you're going to follow, you're, you're just following the, the formulas that everybody else follows, or at least the, you know, the people with influence, the people with power in the organization follow. Mm -hmm. My own belief is that if you are, you know, if you're hyper conventional, that means you're following those conventions all the time. If you're actually strategic, you're probably going to be following those conventions 80% of the time and 20% of the time because it is strategic to do so, you're actually going to be doing something different than what the dictate or what the uh, conventions of the organization would dictate. Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting challenge. So the fact that we're asking employees to be strategic, that we're including it on employee evaluations as a competency, but because it's ill-defined um, and vague, that in, in many cases, it's actually counterproductive in the fact that we're emphasizing it. We're taking ourselves further away from that. And the simple act of if you've been doing a job for a certain period of time and you, you just simply ask, is there a better way to do this task? You, you then chose to be strategic by asking that question. Right, right. I like yep. that a lot. That's, that's a... Very interesting way to way to frame it. Um, so so uh, so building on the strategic thinker, right? That's that's the choice and the behavior. We also then also have process, especially when an organization does have to face a change, whether it's a, a inflicted change or a selected change. They then still have to you know craft strategy and make those decisions. Um, how do you, you know, you deal with a lot of executives, uh, the world that they live in has lots of ambiguity. You have thousands of employees that you could get inputs from. You have customers and suppliers and competitors that you could analyze. How, how do you get, how do you still distill down to the critical amount of information and inputs to help craft a strategy? Uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, I think there's two big things that are important on that front. One is uh, creating what I like to call Zen information flow, which is an environment where fear and egos don't get in the way of you actually having access when you need it to the facts, to the uh, data, to inform your uh, trade-off decisions uh, in, support of, uh, in support of your strategic goals. And so, uh, you know, because that's a problem in a lot of organizations is that the bad news or the stuff that people need to hear because they operate in an environment of fear doesn't, um, doesn't travel up and doesn't travel fast. And so one of the things that I really like, so one of the things that gives me a lot of hope about uh, what's happening in, as the organizations are increasingly uh, adopting agile methodologies, Aside from the methodologies, what I like about the culture around Agile is, you know, some of the some of the slogans like, you know, fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. I think taking, you know, taking the fear out of getting things wrong is is a big thing to increase that information flow. Um, some of the other things that I've heard in organizations and of course that we we preach into organizations and ask them to adopt are you know, mantras around reserving the right to get smarter, mantras around mistakes or intellectual capital. Uh, one of the things that, I, that uh, I've heard and that I really like is uh, mistakes are uh, expected, inspected, and corrected. So again, if you create an environment where, uh, where uh, it's focused on learning and where, you, where it's focused on an expectation that mistakes will happen, uh, then I think you can create that the Zen information flow with, that makes it possible to have uh, uh, make more informed strategic choices. Uh, and all that having been said, you know we are very aware right now of how much of a you know a VUCA environment we live in with you know with volatility and uncertainty and 
complexity and ambiguity, there is just no way to actually prepare for all uh, the, the unknowns. And even if you have Zen information flow, and so I think a lot of it is also now how do you create strategy that uh, puts you in a spot to be uh, uh, resilient? You know, how do you how do you uh, how do you create strategy that uh, preserves options uh, for you? And you know, how do you? Uh, I mean, this is a longer conversation, but you know, uh, how do you how do you take into account? Uh, you know, fat tail risk where, you know, like we're seeing now with COVID-19, which is, you know, uh, how, how do you create that, the uh, resilience in your organization? How do you make yourself, like Nassim Taleb says, anti-fragile so that when uh, the things that are, when you have low probability but high impact events, like we're having now with COVID-19, uh, that, uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't blow you up because you have uh, so fixated on a five-year plan that was based on variables and on a reality that, uh, you know, is, it has dramatically changed. Yeah. No, I think that that cultural environment, right? So it's not just process. It's, it's being open-minded, having a culture where learning occurs, where information can flow, where you have transparency. Um, so that people get the information that they need. So um, we're, we're running out of time, but there's a key question I really want to get to because I think you are far more better positioned to answer this than, than others based on your, your history and your teaching, your consulting. And, and that is really how do you effectively communicate the strategy, right? So a leader at any level, as we've already talked about, might make a decision about where we want to go um, who needs to know that? How do they need to know it? What's the most effective way to really get that across to those that need to understand what direction you've chosen? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's um, something that I care a lot about, and uh, and and I, I've just seen the, the the power of what's possible when you actually meaningfully engage large numbers of people. We rally and align them behind strategy. Um, you know, I remember a long time ago I was uh, uh, working with a new CIO, and he asked me to go with him to visit uh, 700 employees in Portland, and he uh, and he said, "I want you to watch me do this town hall because he's got you know." all these other outposts. So before he goes and talks to everybody else, uh, give me some feedback on how I'm communicating my strategy. And uh, in this town hall, he said, uh, hey, so I wanna tell you about my, my, my strategy. Uh, what I was really brought here to do is to put in place this uh, governance model, and it's called the Comprehensive Delivery Framework. And uh, he went on to explain the comprehensive delivery framework. And uh, he said, okay, what are your questions? And you know, this is 700 people, all of whom are wondering, we've got a new CIO, am I actually gonna have a job here? And somebody raises their hand and said, hey, if I wanna get, if I wanna be supportive of this comprehensive delivery framework, um, uh, what do I, you know, like, how do I support this? And he said, uh, well, you know, I'm going to be putting together some task forces. I think, you know, probably be smart for us to have about seven people from Portland involved in that task force to help me figure this out. So, you know, seven people are going, okay, well, you know, there's 700 of us here. Maybe seven of us will have jobs uh, when this is done. And so what I said to him afterward is, you know, you confuse the map for the territory, right? I mean, you know, this is what you're this is what you're doing, but you need to have a representation of your strategy that actually invites people to help you. You know, it, you know, comprehensive delivery framework is part of your strategy, but we have to communicate a message to people that tells them where we're going and how they're going to get there in a way that's broad enough to explain everything that you're doing in the organization, including comprehensive delivery framework but it's also got to be actionable at every level of the organization so that it, it provides a context for explaining everything that you're doing, but also 
any team at any level in the organization can say, okay, well, hey, well, if that's what strategy is about, we can decide what we're doing in our team to help uh, uh, be aligned and, and, and advance uh, the strategy. And so that's what we did. And that, and that really is the, you know, that's the formula anywhere is, is don't, you know, you can talk about your strategy, but when it comes to having the, the message to, rep to represent and understand uh, you know, a good map is accentuates some things and a good map doesn't try to be the territory that it represents. It can't, or it's not a good map. And it's really about telling a story in a way where people, uh, where people can understand where we're going, why, how we're going to get there. Um, it doesn't sound like a consultant wrote it. It should sound very conversational and it should explain everything that you're doing provide context for all the big decisions that you're gonna make, including the unpleasant ones potentially. And most importantly, it should give everybody an opportunity to go, okay, hey, well, if that's what we're doing, then I, I can figure out how I can contribute. You know, I'm a big fan of that old, you know, schmaltzy story about the, the, the traveler in, you know, ancient times who is, he comes across a stone cutter and the stone cutter is like wailing away at the at the rocks and he looks really peeved and the traveler says what are you doing and he says what the hell does it look like i'm doing i'm a stone cutter i'm cutting stone this work sucks leave me alone so the the, the traveler continues and he sees a guy who's actually really happy and investing discretionary energy in the work that he's doing and a big smile on his face and he says to this stone cutter what are you doing he says I'm building a cathedral. And that's really, I think, what communicating strategy is about, is giving people, helping people, giving people the context and the story so that they can legitimately put themselves in cathedral building mode. Well, that's, that's, that's a great perspective, right? So if you go back to the traditional definitions of strategy, a lot of it is the coordinated actions that, that head towards a common goal. And so in that description, you, you've achieved that, but the extra embellishment on top of that is with, with how much energy, right? So right, right. you get a bunch of people taking daily actions that move them towards the direction chosen, but how much energy do they convert into that purpose that communication becomes one of the effective uh, mechanisms to help provide that energy as well as that connection. So, well, this was a, this was a great, uh, great interview. I really appreciate your perspectives. I'm sure our, our listeners will as well. And uh, thank you very much for participating. Jamie, thanks for having me.